Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to ResearchCon. My name is Rena, and I have a really unique connection to CF that you'll all hear about shortly. I will be moderating the session today and will be introducing our other speakers in just a moment. Before I do, I wanted to provide a few housekeeping items. The session is being recorded and will be available after the event on the CF Foundation YouTube channel. You will be notified by email when session recordings are available. After our presentation, we will take a quick five minute break and then we will be hosting a 45 minute extended Q&A with today's speakers. To ask your questions at this time, we encourage you to hit the share audio and video button to join the speakers on screen. Or you can type your questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A box under the session tab and we will get to them at the end. We won't be able to answer questions about individual diagnosis or treatment plans. And we encourage you to use the information you learned today to have conversations with your care team. The extended Q&A will take place in this room at 9.15 Eastern time. The Q&A portion of this session of this program will not be recorded. If you experience any technology problems during the session, please visit the help desk on the left-hand side of your screen. We also want to remind everyone of our community guidelines. Please be kind, open-minded, respectful of everyone's opinions and life experiences, and please do not ask or give medical advice. If you need staff support at any time or want to report a violation, we also encourage you to visit the help desk. Okay. Old genes, new genes, common genes, and few genes. When I get ready to wear something new, the first thing I think of it's how do I look? If I haven't worn it in a long time, I'm anxious to know, does it still fit? Have I grown? What can I do to be able to fit into these old clothes? Is that even a possibility? I really like to eat. When we started our family many years ago, we had no idea of what cystic fibrosis was and how it would evolve in our lives. It's long lasting impacts are, or how our genes would fit and be a part of the CF community. I have four kids, two boys and two girls. My two boys are ages 22 and two years old, both have cystic fibrosis. My 22 year old was misdiagnosed for many years. When he was four years old, we did sweat testing and a nurse called in to tell me that my toddler has CF. I said, <laughs> who do we need to see, ma'am? See who? Back then, there were no, modula no modulator drugs on the market, and the average life expectancy for someone with cystic fibrosis was 32 years old. Being young parents, this really scared us. My son was placed on pancreatic enzymes and breathing treatments. And from there, we got to manage his condition with some exacerbations ever so often. I prayed for a cure every day, but as time went on and my child grew, I started to feel hopeless. Having a pharmacy background, I would dispense modulator prescriptions to families waiting for the day that our genes would be a fit. Helping others made me really optimistic. I remember feeling like, Will we ever have our genes to be a fit? My kid's life is, is worthy too.
sometimes change can be long. It can seem far, but when it happens, it can happen overnight and we adapt to it. I call it the circle of life. In 2019, we received notice that Trikafta was approved and is a kid is it and is a fit for my kids' genotype. It was by far one of the greatest moments of my life. Looking back and seeing how far that we have come makes me confident that we are getting a step closer to a cure. In 2020, while Gerard was experiencing the greatness of Trikafta, our circle grew as we had another CFR to enter the world. He was also misdiagnosed as his mutations were not detected on the newborn screen. He would show the same signs and symptoms as his brother. And so I knew from birth that he had cystic fibrosis. We would lick him every day and all the time. His skin was always salty. We fought months for a diagnosis. Research is important, it's very important to my family. We look forward to what the future holds. There are many people who currently have genes that do not fit. I want you to know that you're not alone. We are all here with you. What helped me along the way was knowing while our genes were being manufactured, was knowing my genes place in the production process and utilizing the best regimen to manage my children's care. Two decades later, being on both sides with one child whose genes didn't fit the newborn screen, waiting to age into taking a modulator is quite an evolutionary experience. I have witnessed how far research has come and I look forward to new, advance, to new advances in therapies and genes even, and eventually a cure. I can't wait to tell those stories too. And next up, we have Becky Dara. She is a genetics researcher at Case Western Reserve University. She has spent almost three decades researching various aspects of CF, such as new therapies for lung disease and sleep disruptions. She is also a clinical genetic counselor and works with people with CF and their families at university hospitals in Cleveland. All right, hi everybody. Hopefully everyone can hear me just fine. So um, today I'm gonna talk with you a little bit about some of the genetic therapies and the latest interventions and potential benefits. I'll be doing the first portion of this talk. And then my colleague and friend and mentor, uh, Dr. Mitch Drum will be um, moving along to the uh, second portion. So many of you may have interacted with genetics professionals such as me, I'm a genetic counselor. And uh, I see people in the CF clinic um, every week. Um, you may have interacted with a genetics professional or maybe you kind of got your genetics knowledge from your pulmonary care team as well. But my guess is that until maybe the last five years or so, most of that genetic conversation was about inheritance. And that was really where we spent a lot of um, our, our thoughts and energies about the basics of CF genetics was understanding that two people who were carriers for CF had a one in four or 25% chance of having a baby with cystic fibrosis, and then a three out of four chance of having a child who didn't have CF who was either a carrier or not a carrier. Um, the tricky part, if you will, the advanced lecture in genetics for um, people understanding CF was understanding that siblings of someone with CF had a two out of three chance to be a carrier. And that's because we knew they weren't affected. So of the remaining options, two out of three are that they're a carrier for CF. Um, and that's really where a lot of the conversations tended to end in terms of genetics of cystic fibrosis. Uh, but that changed about 10 years ago, and we started having some more complex conversations about genetics, and it got a little bit crazier and harder to understand. 
these are some of the questions that I have gotten and other genetic counselors that I work with have gotten in regards to CF. Um, you know, it, it can be very confusing to think about the genetics and we're going to try to, um, I'm going to give you some tools that I hope will help with that. Um, we, I've been asked, where on my body will the gene editing surgery be? You know, uh, the idea that this is in every cell of your body is is a difficult one. And many people um, picture, you know, we use terms like cutting and, and they picture that this might be a surgery that takes place on a specific site on their body. Um, there's something called a T-track variant in the CF gene. And that sounds confusing uh, when we think about T cell counts and immunology, and that can that can be confusing for people to, even though those are two totally separate things, it can be very confusing. Um, there are many different ways genetically to write the same genetic change. F508 del is the same as that C dot number there, um, but some reports will write it one way, other reports will write it the other. You know, I, why would that be? Why would you need two different ways to say the same thing? But there are. Um, and then one of my favorites is I, I've been asked by people, you know, when will my doctors figure out my mutation? They keep saying it's nonsense. And we'll hear no, more about nonsense uh, tonight. And it's actually a type of genetic mutation with a, a very unfortunate name. Uh, but you can see where that would be confusing. That word has another meaning and, um, and that can be confusing for people. So I'm going to offer up a bit of an analogy, and I think it's it's only fitting, if you will, that um, Rena talked about genes that don't fit, and now I'm talking about a giant cheesesteak. So, um, you know, you can you can do what you want with those two things, but um, we're going to use a recipe analogy to think about these complex genetic concepts in a way that I hope will make sense for you, and it might make um, Dr. Drum's presentation a, a little more understandable. Um, I'm sure many of you have looked up a recipe online. And if you have, it's any point in the last five to 10 years, you'll notice that a recipe doesn't just show up on your uh, Google search or your, your internet search anymore. It has this huge story that goes along with it. And um, we get lots of details about the best market to shop for the ingredients. And you get the smell of the kitchen when you bake it. And maybe some uh, call back to when your grandmother made that, how it made you feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to find the ingredients list. And if you search through long enough, you can usually find those ingredients embedded in that long recipe narrative. Um, but it takes a little bit of work. But we can find those ingredients and from that create an, an ingredients list out of that complex recipe. And hopefully those ingredients then will translate into our final product or our cheesesteak in this case. If we think about that in terms of genetics, the full recipe with all of the filler and all of the description is really like the DNA. And then that ingredients list, that pared down, here's the business end, here's actually what you need to know, is like the RNA. And then the final cheesesteak is the protein. And that's really what you want. That's what you're trying to make through all of this. And we'll talk about how mutations at each of these steps might affect this and then how therapies might target each of these um, different, different stages in the, in the development of a CFTR protein from the CFTR gene, which is the DNA. So in order to think about that, we can talk about um, how this might get messed up or, or what these mutations might do to this. So I mentioned those nonsense mutations a minute ago, and we're gonna talk um, tonight about some different approaches to this. So I wanna make sure we give some context or some background first. <clears throat> so a nonsense mutation is really as if there is a period smack dab in the middle of that ingredients list, and no one's gonna shop beyond that. You're not going to get any food beyond that period. So you have, the, there's an empty plate down there, if you can see it. You have no cheesesteak. You know, this is a crisis. We don't have any cheesesteak. So we have a period in the middle of the ingredients list and we don't have anything to make our cheesesteak or our protein out of. There are uh, other kinds of mutations called splice mutations. Maybe you've heard of those or maybe you know somebody who has a splice mutation. That means that extra words from that initial recipe will be carried over into the ingredients list. And usually they don't make any sense. So in this case, everything in red there on the right-hand side are words that are in the uh, recipe itself, but they don't belong in the ingredients list. My favorite is ask a butcher to slice you. Um, that is part of this recipe, but it shouldn't be in the ingredients list. That's not something we need to actually do, um, nor does it make any sense when, it, I, when I'm going to make this cheesesteak. So from that, you won't get anything. 
Sometimes with splice mutations, there are missing things from the ingredients list. In this case, we only have bread, the butter, and the cheese. Well, it doesn't make a cheesesteak, but it makes a grilled cheese. And, you know, maybe there's utility to that. Maybe that works a, a little bit. So sometimes splice mutations can result in nothing that we can work with. Other times they result in something we can work with. It's just not exactly right. But maybe we can take that grilled cheese and make some utility out of it. In other words, maybe that protein can be functional in some way. And we can come up with a way to augment that and to make that just as satisfying as the cheesesteak might be. Um, finally, uh, certain deletions mean more than others. So in this case, we've got um, the word green is deleted. So we've got a deletion in our uh, recipe that translates to a deletion then in the ingredients list. So a deletion in the DNA to a deletion in the RNA. If I take out the word green, I'm going to get a half of a bell pepper sliced. So it doesn't really matter if it's a green bell pepper. It might be a red one or a yellow one. I'm still going to eat that cheesesteak. It's still going to be pretty tasty. It's still going to be pretty good. That doesn't affect it a whole lot. But if I take out the word pepper instead, if that's my deletion, all of a sudden I've got half of a green bell right in the middle of my cheesesteak. And that doesn't make any sense. That's not something I can eat. Um, so that deletion would be more meaningful or more impactful to my protein or to my cheesesteak uh, at the end. So when we think about genetic mutations in, in these terms, we can understand that a change in that recipe may or may not confer a change in that ingredients list, which may or may not confer a change then in that protein or that cheesesteak. Um, we can think of those, take it one step further, and I promise this is this is the final step of our cheesesteak analogy for right now. Um, we can think about how that might translate into different therapies. So for DNA, if I one option is I can bring in an entirely new recipe with all of the words and all of the filler, and that's gene delivery. I can bring that to the show, and then I don't. It doesn't matter if there were errors in the first one because I'm bringing a whole new copy um, of that entire recipe. Or I can do some gene editing. I could search through that recipe, find the errors, and, and fix them. And we'll talk about some of those approaches today. Um, at the level of the RNA or the ingredients list, uh, there's something called nonsense read-through, which is uh, strategies to remove that period that I talked about at the beginning. So removing that period, being able to read through the rest of the ingredients list and finally make my cheesesteak. And um, there are some, some promising strategies on the horizon for that as well. There are ways that I can mask those red parts for a splice mutation, all of those extra words that were in there. There are ways that I can remove those from the ingredients list. And those are um, short nucleotides. That's um, uh, or, a, a, an approach to be able to tackle that kind of a splice mutation. And then finally, there are strategies to really bring an entire new ingredients list. Rather than bringing an entire recipe, I can just bring the ingredients list, and that's um, mRNA-based therapies uh, to, the, to the cell. Um, but the one you're probably the most familiar with are the CFTR modulators, and they act on the protein itself or act on the cheesesteak itself just to make it in this case for CFTR function a little bit better. Um, so the CFTR modulators are not doing anything with your DNA or your RNA. They're actually working on that final product. But you have to have a final product to work on um, is the case there. So if you have a nonsense mutation or one of those splice mutations or a deletion or a duplication, um, those modulators aren't going to work because there isn't a steak to work on. There isn't a cheese steak to work on. And that's really the hang up with that strategy. So if we think about the sort of the landscape, if you will, of CFTR modulator therapy, we know that about 94% of people with CF have a genotype that makes them um, eligible uh, for uh, some type of approved modulator therapy. And uh, many of those people are, are taking those now with um, great levels of success. But what we're going to focus on tonight are the 6% of people who do not yet have some sort of CFTR restoration therapy for their specific genotypes. And there's a lot of important work to do. And that's what Dr. Drum is going to focus on is what kinds of progress are we making for those individuals? 
The idea is that perhaps another 1.8 to 2% of people maybe will be eligible ultimately from a modulator. And that's that group, that blue bar on the very bottom that says missense or in-frame deletions and insertions. Those are people who have that cheesesteak. They get all the way to the end and they have the cheesesteak and perhaps a modulator will work for them at some point. There are many, many labs that are um, currently working on something called ferrotyping, which is trying the modulators that we currently know about and even other ones that are still in development on their specific cells. They send cheek or uh, nasal brushings to these labs and, and um, try out these different therapies. Um, and the hope is that many of those will eventually become, that the enough testing will be done that we know that they will become responsive or they are responsive to either the modulators that exist now or ones that are still in development. But what Dr. Drum is going to focus on or what are we doing for the others, for those people who don't have that functional cheesesteak or, or, or even non-functional cheesesteak at the end, the people for whom the change in either the recipe or the subsequent ingredients list is kind of um, so deleterious that there isn't a final product to even act on. Uh, so modulator therapies we know will not be effective. And those are people with, again, those nonsense changes, those periods in the middle of the um, ingredients list, people with splicing changes, so extra or missing things from the ingredients list, or people with frame shift, exon, deletion, duplication, kind of big, big changes in that recipe so that it doesn't make any sense. Um, and he will discuss some strategies that uh, are in the pipeline for um, people with those changes. All right, so um, now I'm gonna stop sharing real quick. All right, so Dr. Drum will be coming to you next. And uh, he is my longtime friend, mentor, and colleague. Um, he has been involved in cystic fibrosis research. I can say the number because it's the same as mine for, for over 30 years now. Um, Mitch was part of the team that initially discovered the gene for cystic fibrosis, the CFTR gene. And he's been involved in, in working to um, make people with CF better and through gene therapy and through those advances ever since. So. Take it away, Mitch. All right, thanks, Becky. So, um, yeah, so what I'd like to do is to take you through the process. I'm gonna stick with the cheesesteak analogy um, and try to uh, take you through the process so you can understand where the field is right now, how far we've come, understand the, the hurdles that we face but also appreciate that we're figuring out ways to get over those hurdles. So, um, so again, continuing the, the cheesesteak analogy, one of the things is that, yes, we have a, a recipe, but we're not using that recipe to make a single sandwich, that every cell, <clears throat> excuse me, that makes CFTR is making hundreds and thousands of copies of the CFTR protein. So that recipe's got to do a, a lot of work. And whereas there's one copy or two copies of the, of the gene itself, it'll make perhaps hundreds, thousands of copies of the RNA, and then hundreds and thousands of copies of the protein as well, right? So if we're going to try to fix this, then what do we have to do? Well, we got to create an acceptable recipe. And by that, I mean, we can either figure out a way to fix the recipe that's there, come up with a different recipe, whatever it's going to be. We've got to get the ingredients to the chef to make CFTR or make the sandwich. And we also have to make them last as long as we can, because if we're going to do this, we'd prefer it not to have to be a daily or a weekly or a monthly uh, treatment we'd really like it to be a long-term therapy. If we can get in there and fix the root cause, we ought to be able to make this with a minimal number of uh, uh, re repetitions. Okay. So, right, so here are the pieces and parts again, just to, re to review it is the, our DNA, the gene, that is the recipe. Every cell in your body has two copies of CFTR, and that's what instructs the cell to make either the normal or the mutant version of CFTR, whichever you have. And then from that, the cell knows to make that into the protein or the sandwiches. So 
one of the things we struggle with, so those of us who work in the lab, we're trying to always try to get at the perfect answer for everything. But clinically, that's not really the goal we want. We need what's good enough, what's going to move the needle and make things better. So that's where we're, we're trying to get our head uh, into that place. So what's going to work well enough? So can we replace the recipe? Um, if we, or, sorry, can we edit the recipe first? Can we actually get in there and fix it and make it look like the same gene that somebody who doesn't have CF, what their gene looks like? Can we replace it in some way? Or can we even find maybe something different? Is there a different sandwich that would be just as good as the cheesesteak and will do the job? Is there another protein in the cell that might be able to do what CFTR does that we've overlooked? So here's where we think our options are. We think we can either repair what's broken, whether it be at the DNA, the RNA, or the protein level. We can replace it. We can put in a new recipe. Um, or we can substitute, can we find something entirely different? So at the DNA level, those, we, we have the options to repair and replace. We haven't figured out a, 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 a way to substitute, but from the repair standpoint, it's the, the terms that we refer to are the gene editing, where we're gonna go in and actually fix the, the change in the DNA that causes CFT, CF. Replacement means that uh, we're going to go in and put something else into the genome that will allow it to make CFTR. And that we refer to as gene therapy. So for these things to happen, we have to get stuff into the cell in the first case. So imagine here you can see uh, that little red dot on the DNA. That's where the mutation is. We're going to go in and see whether or not we can uh, put our editing machinery into the cell to actually fix that mutation. And the way we do that currently anyway, is to figure out a way to put the editing machinery into a thing called a liposome or a nanoparticle um, or a virus. And for viruses, what we end up doing is we rip out the stuff that causes it to be a virus and cause you problems and replace it with the a normal copy of the CF gene. But getting that in there and getting the, the editor to fix that mutation will then allow normal mRNAs to be made and then normal protein to be made and everything will be fixed and hunky-dory. So some of the, the take-home messages from this gene editing approach are that when you can, so you can understand sort of the, 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 the problems that we face is that, um, the editing process requires going in and actually breaking the DNA where the mutation sits and allowing the cells repair mechanisms to go in there and fix the gene and make it work as normal. And this is very similar to what happens every day. If you go out in the sunshine and the sun creates a, a, a break in your DNA, your cells know how to repair that most of the time. And so we've learned how to harvest that or harness that process to, uh, to, to repair a mutation that's there. If we do get the edit, one of the issues is that if this edited cell dies, then it's done, right? That makes perfect sense. So things like your skin cells, your hair cells, the cells in your airway called the epithelium, those actually get turned over all the time. So if we edit those, it's only going to last a certain amount of time. So what we need to do is get into what are called the stem cells or the basal cells. Those are the ones that give rise to all the, the ones that are turning over. So we can get into those. Anything that comes from them will also be edited, and then you only have to hit them one time. Okay? So, um, and the editing is very sp specific, but right now our technologies are not all that efficient. So the problem what we're facing is, Yes, we know we can get in there and fix the gene, but can we fix it in enough cells and the correct cells to make a difference? So we're now at the engineering phase of this. We know when CRISPR-Cas and some of these other things came about, it really opened the door and said, yeah, we know we can do it. Now we got to get in there and figure out how to tweak it and make it work as well as we can. So, and I'm going to contrast that with gene therapy because here, instead of 
breaking and fixing the DNA, we're trying to, in those little nanoparticles or viral vectors and stuff, we're going to put a copy, a version of the CF gene, uh, CFTR gene in there, get it into the cell and hope that it will integrate into the chromosome itself and then allow the, the cell to make a normal copy. And it'll do that and it'll still have the mutant version, but it will hopefully have the, the normal version as well. So that somebody with CF treated with gene therapy would be more akin to a carrier, a parent of a CF person who has one defective and one normal copy. Okay. So the, the points of gene therapy are is that it, if we could get then one flavor of CFTR that could work for everyone, right? So there's 2,000-ish different mutations that can cause CF. And with the gene editing, we don't know how many different recipes we're going to have to come up with to address those 2,000. If we can do a, an effective gene therapy, we're only going to need one recipe that will work for everyone. Okay. Um, right now, the way we can get into different cells and stuff that it won't last, the gene therapies won't last forever. So we're going to have to redose with, with those. Um, it doesn't require delivery to basal cells. And in fact, we may not even want them to go to basal cells because the basal cells aren't making CFTR. It's not until they become those uh, final, what we call differentiated cells that you need to have CFTR around. So, um, and one of the things that we still have to work out is, are there any deleterious effects that if we get those things into cells that don't normally have CFTR. It doesn't look like that's a big issue, but we really need to confirm that. Okay. All right, same concepts for at the RNA level. And most of you are more familiar probably with mRNA than you are with any of the other things, because if you went through COVID and you got vaccinated, you probably got an mRNA uh, virus or uh, vaccination. So, so we, we know that that mechanism works. We can stick RNA into our cells and have it make protein. But there's a couple of nuances to this. There's one called RNA editing, where we can actually uh, change the RNA to make the normal protein. And then the other one is sort of like the gene therapy, is we can put normal mRNA in and have it make functional CFTR and use that as a therapeutic. Right? So again, concepts are very similar. So now Instead of getting editors into the cell, we're going to use those little nanoparticles that get into our epithelial cells. But now we're going to deliver mRNA instead of the editing machinery to fix the gene. And if that mRNA gets in there, it will be converted into the fully functional CFTR protein. And hopefully then uh, uh, the, the, you'll see the functional correction and chloride transport and all the things that CFTR does uh, be fixed. So the, the take homes for the mRNA therapy is that it too, like gene therapy, one recipe should work for everyone. You don't need a, a different version for every different mutation. Um, the downside is that it doesn't last very long in a cell. So we know that after several days or weeks or whatever, you're going to have to redose and get more and more, get more mRNA into the cells. And uh, so that readministration is going to be an in inherent uh, feature of an mRNA therapy. Um, it also doesn't require delivery to basal cells, the stem cells. And again, in fact, we probably don't want it to go there um, for these. And then lastly, um, we can actually fix things at the protein level as well. And you're all quite familiar with these. These are the modulators. So one way from the repair standpoint, the modulators will come in and make CFTR, uh, mutant CFTRs like Delta F508, uh, G550ND, many of the others, and actually allow them to then function. So we can repair at the protein level. There was several decades ago, attempts to make CFTR outside of the body and actually administer it back to cells and that didn't work very well. So that's, I don't think there's anybody still working in that area, but that was a strategy that was approached. And then lastly, to go after other proteins in the cell. So there's 
as you may know, CFTR's um, job is to let chloride and bicarbonate and these ions of your body go through the cell membrane. And so folks looked around and said, hey, wait a minute, there's plenty of other proteins in the cell that can do some of those same functions. So there's still an ongoing look to see if there might be another one of those that's normal in the cell that we can hijack and somehow manipulate to do what CFTR normally does. So those are kind of our, our options, right? So we can move through the cell. So can we do it at the DNA level? Can we fix the chromosome? If not, can we go and use an mRNA therapy? Um, and if, that, if there's no options there, then we'll go to things that might uh, work at the protein level. And for right now, we're going to focus on, even though there's lots of different organs affected in CF, so whether it's the lungs, the, your intestines, the pancreas, so on and so forth, we're going to focus right now just on the, the, the challenges with, with the lungs, right? So the basic concepts that we have to deal with are how are we going to get it in there? How are we going to package what we're going to uh, put into the cells? And packaging is important, right? If we're going to go over land, we can put it in a box, send it to where it needs to go. If it's got to go through a liquid environment like your bloodstream, we've got to package it a different way. If we're going to go into the lungs with an aerosol, we're going to have to package it yet a different way. So the, the route makes a lot of, uh, uh, is an important factor in this. And so we have to match that route with the delivery vehicle. So, and then the third component that we have to consider is how do we keep it around for as long as possible? So I'm told that there are Twinkies that have been around since the 1940s, um, other things that have been packaged effectively that last a long time on the shelf. So how do we do that from a, a gene editing or gene therapy standpoint? So the packaging that we think about are, as I mentioned, uh, viruses are one thing. So viruses have evolved to be very effective ways to get DNA and RNA into our cells. But our bodies have evolved pretty effectively to keep them out as well. So there's a lot of work trying to manipulate these so we can put um, the appropriate contents, whether it's CFTR uh, editors or CFTR mRNA. Viruses are being um, engineered to be able to get things into our cells. Lipid nanoparticles, the cells of your body, they're actually made of fats. And if you've ever put uh, uh, oil in water, you can see those little oil droplets, how they fuse with each other. We use that same concept where we coat DNA or RNA with a fat or a lipid and use that to get it to fuse with the cells to get it inside of them the delivery vehicles that we can use. Everybody's familiar with uh, using pills, and that might be a very good way to get into the intestinal tract, but might not be the best way to get into to the lungs. So we think about uh, aerosol deliveries. You know, can we spray it into the, uh, into the lungs? And that's great. That'll get into the surface of the, of the lungs. But these basal cells that we've been talking about, those stem cells that we hope that we can get into, those we might actually have to go into the blood system and come at the cells from the bottom. Um, so we've got to work all those things out. And again, as I said, shelf life, we need to figure out what's the best way to make these things last if we can get them in there. So the kinds of things we have to overcome, you know, those are the conceptual uh, thoughts, but you're probably quite well aware that um, in the lungs, when you have CF, there is a really uh, substantial barrier. You have this really thick, sticky mucus that whatever we were to put in there, if it's an aerosol, or we're trying to get into the lungs, that stuff's got to get through that mucus layer. And that's not a, an, an easy nut to crack. The other thing is that, uh, and I'll go back to the whole uh, uh, COVID vaccination, you know that if you get RNA injected into your arm as a vaccine, it creates an immune response. Well, we're going to have the same issues with some of these vectors that if you put them into a person, that they may develop immune responses to that. So it works fine the first time, but they may develop 
an immune response so you can't redose it. So we're going to have to figure out ways to make sure that our first try is a really good one. Right? Um, and if we can't make it permanent, how are we going to deal with the fact that your lung cells are turning over all the time? Um, and then lastly, those basal cells, those stem cells, those are really hard ones to get at. So we've got to do a lot more work investigating how we can get to those selectively. There's got to be a path to get there. Um, the, the vehicles that we use, these viral vectors, like I said, we can take out the part that makes a virus nasty and replace it with the things we want to. Um, the non-viral vectors, chemistry is becoming very, very good and effective at making these non-viral particles or nanoparticles to carry mRNA or, or DNA. Um, we've got to figure out ways to address the immune system. And there are, you can suppress the immune system. So maybe that's going to be the effective way to do this. Take a temporary immune suppressant while you get your, your gene therapy or whatever. Um, and we also have to figure out how to make these is select. If you're going to do gene therapy or mRNA therapy, we'd really like it to go to the cells that need CFTR. So how do we target those things as well? And probably the thing that folks don't think about much uh, is that we can do all this stuff in the lab uh, pretty straightforward, but if you wanted to be able to use this as a therapy, you have to scale that up in a manufacturing way to make enough uh, to handle you know, going through your whole body and not just one person's whole body, but 30, 40,000 people's whole body. So that scalability is a really uh, major issue in, in getting these things into the clinic. So one of the, the I think, the, the big take-home messages here that is that there are so many things to think about that we really have to have our diverse portfolio and how we're going about this. And I will say, um, as a big plug for the CF Foundation, they have never adhered to the all the eggs in one basket, and they have supported work in all these different areas. Um, uh, we pretty much covered these. Sorry, so I'll go on past that. But just to give you a sense now that uh, there are also investments in some companies now to take these technologies and actually get them into patients. So one called 4D Molecular Therapeutics. They are carrying out... Uh, uh, test using a thing called adeno-associated virus. So this is a small virus that uh, by itself is not pathogenic. So it makes sort of an ideal carrier if you want to put things to sell into uh, people's cells. The downside is that uh, AAV or adeno-associated virus doesn't allow very big pieces of DNA to go into it. So some manipulations have to be done uh, there. But in any case, the initial tests that have been done with this say that it's pretty well tolerated. So now we have to see whether or not, so the safety profile looks good. Now we just have to see what the next phase will look like when we look for, for efficacy of it. Um, uh, we mentioned that there are so many different mutations that we have to think about. Um, and the, the frequency of those different mutations varies immensely. So here, this is just a, a, a of, here are two of the 2,000 different variants that are that can cause CF. Um, if you look around the world, this one called G542X, this is one of those ones that Becky referred to as being the period in the sentence or a premature stop codon. There are 1,400 people known to carry that mutation, whereas this other one just a little bit further down called L558S, um, there are only 12 people on the planet that we know that have that mutation, right? So it doesn't mean that one is any less important than the other, but it does mean that we have to think about those frequencies when we're trying to figure out how to do this. Um, so just to give you a sense of how things are moving, and I, I don't need to tell you that it never seems like things are moving fast enough, but compared to other fields, CF is moving at light speed. And if you look at where we've come since you know, 1989, when the 
gene was discovered to where we are now between modulator therapies and actually trying out some of these different molecular therapies, the mRNA, the viral vectors, and so on and so forth. It's amazing how far we've come. And that's not to say that there's not a long way to go, but we are making substantial progress in that area. Um, with the mRNAs, you know, I, I will say, I think this is one, if you want to look for a glass half full, um, what we've learned about using mRNA in the clinic um, has really moved ahead because of the COVID vaccinations. And so there are now at least three companies, uh, Vertex, Arcturus, and Recode, who are all doing mRNA tests for CFTR right now. So I'm not sure those would have moved ahead as fast as they have had it not been for the successes with the uh, COVID vaccines. Um, so just to look, um, and sorry, this is the geek out for a few minutes here, but just to give you a sense of what's going on, um, the Recode used a, a lipid nanoparticle to put into uh, cells and delivering it as an aerosol. So making a mist and putting it you know, into your nose or, or lungs. And they did this test on some cells um, that were grown in a dish. And what they did, they said, okay, well, let's compare what we get out of mRNA RNA to uh, Trikafta. That's our gold standard right now. We know Trikafta for somebody who has the Delta F508 mutation we know that that is clinically effective. So that's our bar we're going for right now. And if you compare that to what we're calling the buffer here, that's when uh, cells get nothing at all. Compare that to then when they get CFTR mRNA. And the test they're seeing here tells you that the function they're getting, and function here means that basically they're putting a, essentially a, a, a battery tester up against the cells and seeing how much electrical current can go across them. So chloride ions like that carry current. So we can use that electricity as a, as a measure. But anyway, the, the amount of current they're getting out of those cells is about half of what they get out of Trikafta. But it's right along the levels of what Orcombi uh, can, can stimulate. So it looks like it's, you, if you had to predict, you say, okay, that's probably in the therapeutic range. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, another one uh, uh, is a uh, Arcturus uh, product called Lunar. And this mRNA, they've done a very similar type of thing. And look at the, if you put it on the cells, what happens? And they looked at a panel of non-CF cells to say, okay, how much does person one from person two to person three, what's the variation in the population? That's what that blue bar is kind of showing you, what the, the range is. And you compare that to uh, individuals with Delta F508 that haven't been given anything. And the red bar tells you sort of the level they get. But if you give them the mRNA and you look at it, the green bar is showing you how much activity they're able to get. And that clearly goes into the non-CF range. So, excuse me. <coughs> um, so these initial tests are really promising in terms of looking that, like we can really restore CFTR activity. Okay. And that's great. We can show that we can restore the activity. But one of the other things we talked about was, can we get it to the right place? And these really pretty pictures that would make great posters on your wall, um, these are taking those same uh, particles that, that got CFTR mRNA into the cells. But here, they're using mRNA that actually makes a protein that glows or fluoresces. And they put it into the lungs of ferret. Said, okay, we showed you that we can make CFTR mRNA work. Now we're going to show you whether or not we can get it into the right cells. And what this is showing you is if they went into the right cells, these things called the surface epithelium, it should turn the cells green. And you can see clearly there are lots of green cells in this uh, uh, part that says high resolution there. And on the right side, you can also uh, see that it worked. The difference here is the trachea, that main tube in your airways, 
and then where it splits off into what are called the bronchi. You can see in the bronchus here, there's also a bunch of mucus. So not only did it get into the cells, it got through that, um, that yucky, sticky mucus that is such a formidable uh, hurdle to get past. Okay. All right, and I won't spend too much time on this, but just to let you see that there are a lot of different studies going on with these molecular therapies. We didn't talk about the um, test to be able to correct splice mutations, but those are scheduled to start soon. Uh, the mRNA therapies, the uh, gene transfers with the adeno-associated viruses, um, and then uh, uh, also one on that's planned for using another type of virus called lenivirus is in the works. So the point I guess I want to try to drive home here is that we have all those different strategies and they're all being tried because we don't know what's going to win, what's going to cro cross the finish line first. So um, each one has its pros and cons, but we've got to try them all and see what's what's going to work. Um, so I will tell you, so one of the, if I get to be a philosopher for a moment, a number of years ago, we went to the, the Grand Canyon and seeing, I'd never seen it before, get up to the edge of the thing and you see the expanse of this and you're thinking, okay, if I were a pioneer back in the old days and I was trying to get across the country and trying to head to California or whatever, and I came across that, say, holy crap, what am I going to do now? And we don't consider that a challenge whatsoever anymore. We drive an hour to get around it. We take a plane over it, so on and so forth. So those challenges are only challenges um, until we figure them out. And that's where we are with CF right now. We're getting every day, we're figuring out ways to, to cope with these challenges and we're making so much project, progress. Um, and I will leave it there and just um, leave you with, there are also a lot of printed materials um, or online materials also that you can get from the CF Foundation to talk about all of these molecular uh, therapies. So thank you. We're just about out of time. So I want to wrap up. Thank you to all of our, all of our speakers for sharing your knowledge and insight about genetic therapies. That conversation made me really hungry. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and thanks to all of you for your attention this evening. Uh, we will take a, a quick five minute break and then we'll move into our 45 minute extended Q&A where you all can meet and interact with the speakers from today's information session. During this time, attendees are encouraged to click share audio and video and come on camera and ask your questions directly to our speakers. Once you hit share audio and video, we will accept you on screen. After we accept you, you will need to confirm that you do want to in fact come on screen and from here, you'll be able to ask your question. If you have any issues with sharing your audio and video, please visit the help desk. If you would rather ask questions via the chat or Q&A box, you're welcome to do that instead under the sessions tab on the right-hand side of your screen. We, we will be taking questions one at a time and in order of request. We will see everyone back here in the same room in about five minutes. Thank you.